Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christopher Feeney. I'm a white female with long blonde hair and blue eyes. And today I'm wearing a long, uh, what or long sleeve white top with black trousers. I'm the director of Employers for Change, which is an employer disability information service. And you can get more details about our work and any of our upcoming events and seminars at employersforchange.ie. And be sure to follow us on LinkedIn and on Twitter. Thank you all for joining us today for our seminar on creating disability confident and inclusive workplaces. We're delighted to have this session facilitated by Owen O'Hurley, who's Managing Director of O'Hurley Access Consultancy. Owen is a first class graduate in materials and engineering technology and completed an engineering research master's degree in March of 2003 in the field of accessibility, universal design, workplace design, ergonomics and accessible schools. Having moved to become a public sector accessibility specialist with the National Disability Authority in 2003, Owen was instrumental in the design and implementation of the NDA's first ever national award scheme, the Excellence Through Accessibility Award. He established O'Hurley Access Consultancy in August 2007, and with over 14 years of experience working as an accessibility consultant and trainer, Owen has advised an array of clients and has so many incredible awards uh, and achievements that I'm not even going to dare to try to go through them all this afternoon, to be honest. But we're really thrilled to have you here, Owen, and we're really looking forward to hearing and learning more from you about how employers can create that disability confident and inclusive workplace. So over to you. Thanks, Christabel. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. That's a, a nice introduction you gave me there. It makes me sound really great, you know what I mean? Um, sorry, and just to, just as a, a way of a background, uh, I'm a white male with dark grey hair, I suppose, at this stage. Um, I have a blue shirt on with a grey uh, uh, jacket as well. Um, so thanks very much for inviting me here to uh, speak uh, this afternoon. And I suppose as, as the title of the, the workshop is Creating Disability Confident and Inclusive Workplaces, I suppose what I'm going to try and do here today is share my experience from working with, I suppose, some We've been very lucky to work with some uh, really interesting national and international clients in the area of accessibility and universal design who have a special interest in, in I suppose, creating inclusive workplaces for people with disabilities, but also ensuring that the services that they provide to their customers are fully accessible. And I suppose what I'd like to do today is share some of the, the knowledge and skills that we have uh, uh, implemented with some of these companies to create the, the inclusive workplaces and so on. Um, it's not going to be um, a session about how to design a ramp or how to design steps. It's really going to be about the strategy and framework that you need to implement within your own organization um, to improve and embed accessibility in everything that you do. Um, so hopefully that will be, that's the main aim of the session is to really reflect on how you can actually um, embed accessibility and universal design to create inclusive workplaces for your colleagues with disabilities but all, all colleagues, but also to look at how you can improve the visitor or customer experience within the organizations that you work in yourself. So um, without further ado, I'll just go straight into the presentation. Um, I suppose quick agenda or overview what we'd like to cover. Uh, why create disability inclusive workplaces? Um, some, you have some legislative requirement, requirements, but also to trying to just give a better understanding about what the barriers that people with disabilities face within workplaces are. Um, and then to look at the framework, so give you eight to 10 key areas that you need to focus in on in order to create an inclusive workplace and to finish off then with 12 high level recommendations on how you can actually uh, embed accessibility and, and universal design and everything that you do. So we're all aware, I suppose, and I'm not going to get into the background about statistics and things like that, but we're all aware that the, the population in, in the world is about over is over one billion people. An ESRI report in 2018 identified that 18.5% of the Irish population are living with a disability. So that's about one in five. So, um, and we are also living in a country where the, the, the population is aging. So there's a shift in our demographics to uh, an aging population. And as people age, we're all aware that more and more people will, will have more have additional accessibility needs as, as you go through your life and so on. But the social case for accessibility is that everyone benefits from good from good accessibility, whether you're a parent with young kids or whether you're living in an apartment and your lift breaks down and you need to carry your heavy bags of shopping up the stairs and through heavy doors and things like that. So if you're a first time visitor to a bus station in Rome, 
you're going to benefit from good accessibility by having good wayfinding and signage and things like that. So the social case for accessibility is that everyone is going to benefit from, from, from good uh, access and universal design. The legal case is that we have legal requirements in Ireland around uh, implementing accessibility. And I suppose it's not just Ireland, it's all around the world. There, there, is, le there is legislative requirements to uh, ensure that we do not discriminate against people with disabilities in the provision of goods and services, but also in the area of creating inclusive workplaces. So. Uh, we're not discriminating against employees who, who are who are either applying for jobs or who are actually working within within your own companies. The business case, there's a massive business case for accessibility in everything that you do. So if you if you are providing a service to members of the public, we, we've just said one in five of the population. So at least 20 percent more customers you're going to have if you if you can um, if you can address the business, uh, if you can if you can make your your services more accessible. But the business case is also about retaining employees in the workplace so that you you know which will reduce your 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 costs in in recruitment and retention and stuff like that so um it's also the business case is is, is tapping into an uh, is tapping into uh, um uh, an additional workforce that that you may may have not considered in the past and stuff like that but it's all about recruitment and retention and reducing your turnover costs by having to um, uh, um keep employees with disabilities in the workplace and so on the moral case is all about rights and i suppose that should maybe be the first uh, reason we should address accessibility and, and and inclusive workplaces but everyone has a right to be included within society everyone has a right to get a job everyone has a right to be educated and so on uh, so with, there is there is there is a rights-based approach to accessibility and hopefully everyone is aware that we have a un convention on the rights of people with disabilities there's a number of articles that 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 will impact on that and impact on irish society well, all the articles do, but for example, there's one of the articles in relation to employment and there's another article in relation to uh, accessibility and so on. So um, if you're unaware of the UN CPRD, um, a, a good website to go into to find out a bit more about that would be the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission, www.ihrec.ie, um, which good information about the UN, uh, good background and good videos around an introduction to the, to the UN CPRD. We've got the diversity of the population, so no two people within the workplace are going to have the same needs. Uh, it's, it's estimated that three out of 10 people within your own organization will be an employee with a disability, maybe a hidden disability or a minor impairment and so on. So, you know, you, you have colleagues who are in the workplace at the moment that you're unaware that they have a disability, um, but they may, they may need accessibility requirements. And that's a real reason why we must address this area. And then we've got the whole area of universal design, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. but. Universal design is all about design, is about designing products, services, buildings, and information that's accessible and usable for everyone, um, regardless of people's age, size, or ability. And I think that's really important. Is that like we should be striving towards universal design or inclusive workplaces so that we make them better for everyone. Okay, so that that's the the real message there. We also have um, some some legislative requirements. So, um, and I know. Um, employers for change have, have 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 a number of toolkits and, and and guidelines and resources that are available to assist employers in the workplace but just to be be mindful that there's four or five very important pieces of legislation to be aware of and a key questions that come up uh, in practice would be do you, do you, does your organization need to make um make the workplace accessible to meet the needs of employees with disabilities and the answer to that is yes and why because we have legislation do you need to make your buildings accessible yes again because you have legislation around making buildings accessible in ireland and if you are a service provider providing goods and services to the members of the public do you need to make them accessible to meet the needs of people with disabilities and again the answer to that question is yes so there's three very important questions employment buildings and uh, services and the answer is as you see there is that you must make them all uh, fully accessible to meet the needs of people with disabilities why because as i said we've legislation so for example and i'm just going to get my pen working here under um under the area of employment or inclusive workplaces we have the employment equality act 1998 to 2018 and we also have health and safety legislation under under the health and safety authority so under the employment equality act of, of 1998 you cannot discriminate against the uh, um, you cannot discriminate against people with disabilities in all areas of employment, whether it's recruitment, whether it's retention, whether it's performance management, whether it's continued professional development, whether it's the provision of training and so on. So it's really important to 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 to, to be mindful that 
under employment equality legislation, you cannot discriminate against people with disabilities. Under the health and safety legislation, then, you have a legal requirement under what's called Regulation 25 of the 2007 regulations. So under this regulation, you must ensure that uh, you, you make your workplaces, uh, so employers have a legal obligation to make their workplaces accessible to meet the needs of their employees with disabilities. So if one of your colleagues acquires a disability next week and your workplace is, is inaccessible, under the health and safety legislation, you actually have a, a legal obligation to, to accommodate that uh, in, in employee with, dis, with, a, with a disability within the workplace. The Health and Safety Authority have produced guidelines around that. So the HSA have produced guidelines ar around that, that area. I will, I, will, I will pass them on to Christabel after today's session and, and everyone can, can get access to those as well. So that's the answer to question one. We must address them, uh, meeting the needs of employees with disabilities under Employment Equality Act and Health and Safety legislation. Under, under the area of buildings, then we have we, in Ireland, we have what are called building regulations. We have 12 building regulations that impact on all areas of design. So for example, if we were designing a new office in, uh, in St. Stephen's Green, it must comply with what are called the building regulations. And one of those building regulations is called Part M, Access and Use. And the requirements of Part M, Access and Use is that we make buildings accessible and usable for as many people as possible. We have what we, we, we've, We've, we've technical guidance documents associated with, with our building regulations, and they're basically guidelines on how you can actually meet the building regulations. Um, so the, the technical guidance document M, or TGDM as it's called, is, is a minimum guide on how we actually meet the requirements of Part M. It's 127 pages long. It gives us guidance on how to design lifts, how to design stairs, uh, signage and wayfinding, hearing enhancement systems, good lighting, visual contrast for people with, with vision impairments, how we can make sure ramps aren't too steep for, for people with mobility impairments and things like that. So a lot of good guidance in there. And since 2010 in Ireland, every new building that's being built has to apply for what's called a disability access cert. And they would apply for this to the local authority. And the local authority would grant, uh, would give them a certificate to say that in their opinion, the building will meet the requirements of part M of the building regulation. So uh, I suppose just to, to in, in relation to access to buildings, we have regulations in order to make the design of the building accessible, but we've also enhanced procedures now under our building control regulations that we must apply for what are called disability access certs. And we also must do mandatory inspections during construction of new buildings um, to, to make them accessible. So it's really important that if you're, if you're working with your facilities management team, that they're, they're aware that we have these building regulations and so on. Under access to services, there's, there's three, year, three pieces of legislation that you need to, to to be to be aware of you've got the equality equal status act of 2000 2018 you've got the irish human rights and equality commission act of 2014 and we've got the disability act of 2005 the disability act 2005 only applies to the public sector it doesn't apply to any private uh, company or organization that are that are on the call here but there are some you know good ways that you can improve accessibility by meeting some of the requirements of the disability act as well so let's start with the equal status act under the equal status act it's illegal to, um, to discriminate against people with disabilities in the provision of goods and services. So a key requirement here is that you must reasonably, you must reasonably accommodate all your customers with disabilities as a, as a requirement of the, of the Equal Status Act 2000 to 2018. Again, the Irish Human Rights and Quality Commission have some very good guidance on their website about uh, how, how you address reasonable accommodation, what is reasonable accommodation and, and how to, uh, and, and how to uh, ensure that you don't discriminate against people with disabilities. Um, the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission Act of 2004, again, that applies to public sector only. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail today, but it's all about human rights and equality. And basically, uh, there's a section called Section 42, which, which covers public sector duty. Under the requirements of Section 42, public sector duty, uh, the public sector bodies must uh, put policies and plans in place on how they're going to address human rights and equality in the provision of their services. And they must report annually um, uh, within their, for example, their annual reports, they must demonstrate how they're actually addressing uh, um, equality of services in, in, in relation to human rights and equality and so on. Again, I can happy to share any more information on that later on with people, but um, that is a key requirement. The Disability Act 2005, again, some key requirements. As, as a result of the Disability Act 2005, all public bodies in Ireland must appoint an access officer. The access officer is a point of contact with people with disabilities who want access to services they provide. They must make sure the public areas of their public buildings are, are fully accessible. 
they must ensure any information that they provide to uh, to, to their customers uh, is fully accessible to meet the needs of people with disabilities and they must ensure that they have a, a complaints officer which is known as an inquiry officer the government has set targets that six percent of all employees would be employees with with, with with disabilities they've set a target by that has to be met by 2024 um what else is there so there's the access officer there's the buildings there's the services there's information there's also procurement you must ensure you embed accessibility as part of your procurement and public tendering exercises and so on so look I, that was just a, a quick overview of the legislation uh, i could spend the whole hour going through going through that and going into the detail but i just wanted to make sure that people are aware that look there are legal requirements as an employer as a service provider and a, a, in, in the design and construction of your buildings as well you must address accessibility. We really want to focus in on the whole idea of this session is to look at, I suppose, uh, disability inclusive workplaces. So I suppose one area just to be aware of is that we, we kind of, the message we like to give out is that like, we, we must address universal design and universal design is, is, is trying to cater for as many people as possible. So there's two uh, definitions on the screen here. I, I'll just read out the second definition. Universal design refers to the design and composition of an environment so that it can be accessed, understood and used to the greatest extent possible by all people, regardless of their age, their size or their disability. Um, so what are we really saying? We're really saying is let's ensure that any products and services that are being designed, any buildings, any information that you provide is fully accessible to cater for as many people as possible. And I always use this example here. Uh, it's from OXO, who are a product developer. And on the screen, if you can't see the screen, on the screen, there's a, a, an image with, with a series of gloves and, and no gloves. So there's there's gloves for kids, there's gloves for adults, there's small gloves for small hands, big hands and things like that. And the whole idea here is that um, um, what OXO have recognized is that no one size fits all. So no one size fits all. So let's ensure that any products that OXO, they've said, let's ensure that any products that we design are fully accessible and inclusive to cater for as many people as possible. So the simple thing like a potato peeler that's designed with an easy to grip uh, pressure absorbing handle uh, means that it can be used by as many people as possible and so on. And the measuring jug, uh, again, if you can see the measuring jug on the screen, it's just a, it's like a standard measuring jug, but it's got a, a, a bigger, easy to grip handle. And inside in the measuring jug, there's a you can read the, the, the you can take the, 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 the measurements of um, how much water or milk you're putting into the jug and things like that. So it's a real, it's really good example because you know most people when they get the measuring jug they put it up to their face and they pour it up boiling hot water and it, it, there's the health and safety issue and so on. Whereas with the OXO uh, measuring jug you can leave it on the table, you can look down on top of it and you can pour your water in and stuff like that. So simple things that can make a massive difference in everyday life is, I suppose, is what universal design is 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 all about. So we 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 talk about that as we go through the presentation and so on. But I suppose. You know, we can focus on disability access, but we, we really want to focus on access for everybody uh, because it's, it's going to make it better for uh, it's going to make it better for, for, for everyone in, in the long run. Uh, in relation to the barriers faced by people with disabilities, again, most people, when we when we look at this in, in, in workshops and exercises, they'll focus in on wheelchair access and they'll focus in on ramps and steps and lifts and toilets and stuff like that. And they'll focus in on the built environment. And there might be a small mention of public transport. Or we might get into things like well hearing enhancement for people with hearing impairments and stuff like that and um, i suppose what's really important is that we, to recognize that um the barriers or challenges faced by people with disabilities come in many different forms so for example the first barrier that someone with a disability might face when they're applying for a job is getting information off your website as an example so are, are downloading an application form or ensuring that the the application form is is fully uh, is designed to cater for someone who has dyslexia and things like that. So I've just tried to kind of on this slide is it give, gives five key areas, five key head, headings that are some of the barriers faced by people with disabilities as they go about their daily lives, but also in the area of employment within, within the workplace. So access to good information, access to good public transport so they can actually get to the workplace or get to the town or city that they want to go to, access to the built environment that we're all aware of. So um, products and services. So, are the services that are being provided by your organisation accessible to meet the needs of people with disabilities? So, whether that's someone applying for for a mortgage or for for a, you know a going online to pay their motor tax, or whether it's um, a, someone going into a museum or a gallery or an event and stuff like that, and then the whole area of inclusive workplaces. 
So when we there are other barriers, like for example, access to housing, access to protected structures or buildings of, of historical significance and, and so on. But what I'm really trying to, to highlight here is that the types of barriers faced by people with disabilities within the workplace can be physical barriers, they can be information and communication barriers, they can be technology barriers. So, you know, getting onto a computer and, 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 and using um, technology, they can be com com communication barriers when accessing the services that you provide, it could be face to face over a reception, or it could be uh, in, in a meeting, and they can be related to workplaces. So hopefully, when you leave the session today, you're thinking differently about what type of barriers that, that people with disabilities actually face as they go about their uh, in, in the workplace. And what I've tried to do is just create some case studies. I'm not going to go through them all, but you'll have them all after, after the session. So for example, here's an example of a, of a case study uh, for, 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 for someone, an, an, older, an older lady who has a hearing impairment. And it just, on the left-hand side, it gives all the, 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 the types of barriers. So the physical, the technology, the workplaces. And on the right-hand side, it gives some examples of what they, what they are. So for example, uh, physical barriers could be things like um, lack of lack of uh, accessible hearing enhancement systems in the reception and meeting rooms it could be poor acoustics in the in the canteen that can be very distracting for someone with a hearing impairment technology barriers could be lack of assistive technology provided within the workplace to cater for someone uh, with a hearing impairment but communication barriers then could be for example someone who's attending a meeting with a hearing impairment may may like to get the information in advance so that they can prepare and plan for the meeting and so on so by not actually facilitating that employee within the workplace, you're, cre you're creating a, a, a barrier for them to be fully included within the workplace. And then we have things like employment. So, uh, you know, if, if someone with a hearing impairment goes to an interview and the right technology are, aren't in place or that the people who are on the interview don't actually know how to communicate with someone with a hearing impairment, then that's going to be a challenge for, for that person. But what happens if there's a fire in the building at five o'clock on a Friday and everyone's left? someone's got a hearing impairment and, and they, there's no flashing alarm and, and so on. So they're, they're just examples of, of hearing impairments. The next example is uh, of someone with a vision impairment. Again, some physical barriers could be things like poor lighting. They could be things like um, uh, uh, poor, vi poor, poor design of, of, of signage and wayfinding. And they could also be things like visual contrast. So visual contrast, if you haven't come across it before, is, is about ensuring that um, you have good contrast between floors and walls, that people can pick out where the door is, that there's no hazards that like, for example, if you have lots of glazing, that, that people with vision impairments don't walk into the glass and, 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 and so on. But the, you know, the key, if someone has a vision impairment, access to information is gonna be key, access to, to good technology, providing assistive technology within the workplace. So, so for example, it could be software to allow a person to have a screen reader on their computer. It could be creating accessible PDFs, creating accessible documents, but also things like delivering uh, uh, accessible presentations and so on. Um, it could be communication barriers, could be you know, uh, staff or, or, or colleagues not being aware of how, of how to actually assist someone with a vision impairment to get around the building or not knowing how to communicate. And then it could be things like, you know, if someone, someone with a vision impairment comes for an interview, is the information available in accessible formats? So does someone need, need a electronic copies of information? Do they need Braille? Do they need large print? Uh, and, and so on. I've given an example. The next example I'm going to skip over. It's a, for, for a wheelchair user. But as I said, on the left hand side are all the, the barriers and challenges and are, are the categories. And on the right hand side are, are some examples. Just one example there that you may not have thought about. Uh, if someone has a mobility impairment or they're in a wheelchair, they want to feel safe and secure as they as they go at, within the workplace. So one area that you, you may need to consider is like your basement car park. So is, is again, it just came up recently, a, a wheelchair user saying that they, they felt very insecure working, going down to the basement because they didn't feel safe in that environment and stuff like that. So it's not just about, you know, the, the ramp and the steps. It's it could be things like uh, adult changing places. It could be uh, um, having charging points in your reception area to allow a wheelchair user to charge their, their, their mobility scooter. Um, and it could be things like reasoned accommodations, allowing a person to come into work a bit later because, uh, because public transport is full at, at eight o'clock in the morning and they can't get a space on the bus and, and, and things like that. I've given an example of someone who has a hidden disability, maybe autism, um, and then things like poor acoustics, uh, lack of quiet spaces, but also understanding how 
people with autism may interact and, and, and stuff like that. So again, I know as I am, I've done some very good presentations for, for employers for change and they're available on, on the net. But if you haven't seen them, I'd highly recommend that you go in and, and learn a bit more about, about the whole area of neurodiversity and autism within the workplace and so on. Um, I've given an example of someone with a temporary disability, such as a broken arm or broken leg. We've all experienced temporary disability, but a little challenge for you for later on. Go, go home with, or when you're at home or if you're at home now, go try and open a carton of milk with one hand later on and see how you get on and see how easy it is to, to use. And that's an example of poor product design uh, to cater for, for, for everyone. Uh, and then I'd give an example of dyslex, dyslexia. So simple example of dyslexia would, uh, you know, even things like accommodations in the workplace, not if you have filing systems, use colors as well as uh, uh, letters and numbers, because it's much easier for someone who's dyslexic, dyslexic to actually file things by color rather than, than having to, um, to, to look at, um, you know, the, the numbers and letters and stuff like that. Also use upper and lowercase lettering in all your documents, in all your signage, in all your wayfinding, because someone who's dyslexic, they read the shape of the word rather than, than, than what the actual block capital letters are, are, is saying and stuff like that. And ensure you have policies and procedures around creating accessible documents. So I think you've got the message here that look, accessibility barriers and challenges come in many forms, the physical barriers, information and communication barriers, technology, uh, inclusive uh, workplaces and also communication barriers which is like your customer services are interacting with your colleagues and, and, and so on and um, so on to the more 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 important part of the of the of the conversation and we're looking at um the area of a framework for inclusive workplace so uh, what i would what i would say to everyone as part of this session is that there's about four or five big high level actions that you need to take in order to address, uh, to be fully address accessibility and to create inclusive workplaces. And they are things like you need to get buy in from senior management. So you need to get, you need to have a top down approach to accessibility. You need to get buy in from senior management and you need to have accessibility on the agenda. Okay. So that's number one. The second thing is you need to have people within your organization who are going to be responsible for implementing or overseeing accessibility. So you need to have either an access officer or an access champion, and then you need to establish a team within your organization to embed accessibility in what you're doing. Because if, for example, if I was the access officer and my area was facilities management, I'm not going to know anything about website accessibility, or I'm not going to may, may not know anything about welcoming customer services, or I, 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 may, I'm a, I might know how to make the HR policies and procedures more accessible. So I'm just going to be a facilitator for accessibility, and I'm going to bring a group of people around the table who can actually help me implement it. So once you've got that team of people around the table, you need to benchmark your current levels of accessibility in line with national and international good practice. And then you need to develop a policy and an, an action plan or a framework or a strategy, depending on what way you want to look at it. So really what we're saying here is, look, you need to, I suppose, you need to commit to accessibility. You need to plan for accessibility and then you need to implement accessibility. And it's not something that you're going to do within two weeks. And it's not something that you're going to say, well, let's do this over a month and let's put it, put everything back on the, on the shelf and, and work away. It has to be an ongoing process. And it has to be, a, 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 I suppose, a continuous improvement model. The other and very important thing, which I haven't mentioned, is that you need to make sure that your colleagues and your customers with disabilities are involved in the process. So the importance of consultation and stakeholder engagement. So what I've really done with this slide here is just say, this is what I think is the framework for building an inclusive workplace. So you, um, I, the top two items there are committing to accessibility and planning for accessibility and that is all about your strategy and your framework the next few pieces of criteria are things like training and awareness hr products and services information provision and so on so those six areas are the six areas that you really need to focus in on in order to become a disability confident employer but also to become a, a i suppose making your services and your products accessible to meet the needs of people with disabilities so what I'm going to do now for the rest of the presentation is just talk you through some of the things that you need to be doing under each of those eight categories. OK, and I'm going to if I don't speed up a little bit, I'm going to run out of time. So I'm just going to I'm going to just go through some of these quite quickly and happy to answer questions at the end. So number one, commit to accessibility. Your organization should commit to providing accessible workplaces, products and services and welcoming customer services. I've, just, I've already mentioned 
here's some tips on how you to do it. Ensure that you have senior management commitment, so a top-down approach to accessibility. Ensure that you have an annual budget towards, towards accessibility so that you can get some of the, so you can continuously make improvements in the area of accessibility. The, the good governance is, is, is all about reporting um, and also ensuring that you write accessibility into your strategic statements or your strategic strategies and so on. Um, annual reporting, make sure you report to senior management on an, on an annual basis on how you are making improvements to accessibility are identifying some of the challenges that you're facing in, in relation to improving access. And ensure accessibility is embedded within your corporate state strategies or statements so that, so that everyone sees from the very outset that accessibility is a key area that you want to address uh, within, within your organization. Number two, plan for accessibility. Your, your organization should put the necessary plans and procedures in place to ensure that you're providing accessible workplaces, products and services for your customers and colleagues. How are you going to do that? Well, you're going to appoint an access champion or an access officer uh, within the workplace to assist your colleagues and customers. You're going to establish an accessibility team or working group uh, who's, going to, who's going to be responsible for implementing accessibility within your organization. And just to give you like, like an idea, most, most companies have a health and safety officer and a health and safety team. And you can see how health and safety is embedded within your company. Accessibility should just be the same thing. Our inclusive workplaces should just be the same same thing. You need to have people who are responsible. And then <clears throat> number three there is you need to ensure your, your um, you need to make sure that your, your colleagues, your potential colleagues and your customers are aware of, of who to contact to, to find out more about accessibility. And number four, which is I think is really important. And if you take nothing else from today is, is consult with your end users. So con consult with your, your, your existing employees, your potential employees and your customers and, and find out what challenges they face in relation to accessing, uh, accessing what, you, what you do, okay? Um, number five, six, and seven really relate to benchmark, benchmark, benchmark where you're at in relation to national and international good practice. So for example, if you, do, if you haven't audited your buildings in the last five years, then part of this review will be saying you need to carry out an access audit. Uh, how are you ensuring that your information is accessible and stuff like that? So benchmark accessibility in line with the, the key criteria and then put a policy and an action plan in place on how you're going to uh, uh, create that inclusive workplace and then promote promote the good work that you're doing. So if you do get to a stage where you've benchmarked, you've developed your policy and plan, you have your team in place and things like that, let people be aware that what you're doing and, and, and try to get more buy-in from, from everyone within the organization. So that's a quick overview of the process that you should take in order to, 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 to start addressing accessibility and universal design if you haven't done it already. This, the next things we want to look at are, well, what are the key areas you need to be looking at? So for example, the first one is training and awareness. So we would recommend that you do ongoing training and awareness in the area of inclusive workplaces, accessibility, universal design, and so on. So ensure all staff are provided with necessary disability awareness training. And I've just given you four little tips here, right? One, identify what the training needs are for the organization. So for example, there's going to be a general uh, rollout of disability awareness training, but also there may be more technical training for the facilities managers, for the ICT department. So the, so the webmaster or the web team, the audio visual team may need to have training, the events team who's looking after all the events and conferences that are taking place or meetings and seminars. And then you've got things like procure, looking at things like procurement and stuff like that. So really dig into, dig into it, identify what, 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 what areas you will need training to address accessibility, roll out general disability awareness training, but also identify some technical training that you, you may need and, and, and so on. Okay. Um, so, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So we just said there, like there, there, there's also health and safety. Like for example, another area that you may identify training needs would be in the area of health and safety. So how are you ensuring that people with disabilities can get safely out of your buildings in emergency situation? Do you provide training for people on how to use evacuation chairs? Do you provide training for, for, for the health and safety team to, so that they embed accessibility and so on? So look, the message here about training and awareness is that can roll out ongoing awareness campaigns around accessibility and inclusive workplaces, but also identify what your training needs are uh, in, in all the kind of areas that you work in. So for example, one area I didn't mention there was the importance of training for the HR department so that they can create inclusive workplaces. 
and that ties nicely into the number the next section which is hr ensure all hr policies policies plans and procedures consider accessibility and again i'm not going to go into uh, too much detail here but um where can you find out more uh, information employers for change have, have have a number of toolkits that they have launched and a very good toolkit that I've come across in, in my work is a, a toolkit from NUI Galway. So a, NUI Galway in their equality and diversity uh, and inclusion uh, part of their website have a really good guide on the whole area of uh, how to accommodate um, or how to um, create inclusive workplaces for, for to meet the needs of people with disabilities. But look, there's a number of areas that you need to address if you haven't come across it before. You need to ensure that your recruitment um, your procedures and practices are, are, are fully accessible and inclusive. You need to ensure that your organization addresses disclosure and that I suppose that that people within your within your company company are comf comfortable to disclose that they have a disability and, and that they're 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 aware that it's a positive thing rather than a, a negative thing. Uh, you need to ensure that you have reasonable accommodation policies and practices in place. So again, if you haven't come across reasonable accommodations, it's about adaptations that you can make within the workplace. Uh, but also adaptations to policies and uh, practices that you have to, to accommodate people with disabilities. So things like flexi working breaks, uh, um, uh, changing someone's hours, uh, down to things like um, larger keyboards or, lar or, or, or using assistive technology on computers and things like that. Uh, performance management, how are you ensuring that you, you're addressing uh, accessibility uh, or, or the needs of people with disabilities as part of your performance management systems? Retention. So you may have colleagues who acquire a disability due to an illness or an accident or the aging process. You want to make sure that you can retain those employees within, within the workplace. So as part of your uh, retention policies, ensure you address the whole area of disability access and so on. And then things like absence management. But again, a lot of the, so there, there, there are six areas that you need to be focusing in on, but a lot of this thing is about the process. So it's about the process of reviewing your existing HR policies and procedures and practices and going about making implementing changes to ensure that accessibility is implemented into all of all of these areas and um, so it's a it's a bit like a, a continuous improvement model assess plan create act review so assess where you are now and um, benchmark against na national and international good practice and then start planning for making improvements and then you're acting upon it and you're making changes and then you're continuously going around because by the time you finish that circle the guidelines will have changed and there'll be more information available. So you need to keep up to date with, 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 with good practice. So I'm going to skip over some of these slides, but I have slides here, just kind of more slides in the area of HR and inclusive workplaces and, and telling you information what to do. So there's there's some slides here about what is reasonable accommodation uh, uh, and, and so on. But what I will do is I will share these slides afterwards. And if you want some more guidelines, uh, Christabel will send on some on, from Employers for Change, but these are ones I've come across which I find very good. Recruiting, managing, developing people with a disability or a health condition, a practical guide for line managers, published by the CIPD in the UK. Disability, employment and, and inclusion, the guide to success, which is about a 100 page document about creating inclusive workplaces again, which is very good. So we've, we've talked about training and awareness. We've talked about employment. The next area we want to talk about is products and services. So Products and services is really all about making sure that your customers, that you're not discriminating against your customers with disabilities. So how are you going to do that? You're going to make sure that any products that your organization develops are fully accessible and inclusive. And you're going to make sure that you have welcoming customer services for people with disabilities. So how are you going to do that? You're going to train staff about in the area of disability awareness. You're going to talk to your product developers and, and see how they're addressing accessibility. But more importantly, you're going to bring people onto your team that can, can, that, can, can, that can help you to address these, these areas and so on. So um, your organization should ensure that accessibility is considered when purchasing or providing products and services is another way. And one another really important recommendation I would make today is that if you have a procurement officer or if you have someone within your company who's responsible for uh, uh, looking at purchasing or buying uh, goods and services, then you need to make you need to, you need to advise them that they must be ensuring that accessibility is a key part of the brief when going out to purchase or buy uh, new products or new services or getting in new contract cleaners or getting in new uh, caterers to, to 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 work within your workplaces and so on. So a really important message here is that 
if you have procurement policies or tenders or uh, strategies around buying stuff, go back and review them and see how they can be how they can be strengthened in the strengthened in the area of accessibility and universal design. Okay. And if you don't do anything, if you listen, if you don't listen to anything else I say today and you go away and do that, everything you buy or purchase from now on will start addressing accessibility, which is a really great start in, in the in the area of uh, creating inclusive workplaces. Information provision then uh, we normally do an exercise when we do training sessions and we get people to think about well what what types of information do you need to make accessible and these this would be a typical answer that we'd have here on the screen so we're looking at three areas we're looking at digital written and spoken and signed and by signed we mean sign language interpretation and so on and you can see here the typical answer that people have given so under digital making your website accessible ensuring that the content that you put up on the web is accessible making sure videos that you produce uh, uh, include subtitles or audio description, making sure any podcasts that you give out uh, are fully accessible. Written information is, is things like forms and leaflets, providing information in accessible format, making sure your annual reports are fully accessible and things like that. And then spoken and signed, which is really important, is face-to-face is -face communications, it's, it's sign language interpretation, it's over the phone, it's customer call centers. And I suppose what I'm trying to, paint a picture here of is that everything all every piece of information that you provide what either to your colleagues or your customers needs to be made it made accessible okay and that's really important and we categorize it in three areas digital written and spoken and signed um, and if we talk about written first um some kind of key areas that you need to look at is that your information needs to be made available in alternative formats so what I give one high level recommendation around create, about accessible information, and that would be create a policy around uh, an accessible information policy around how you're going to uh, create accessible documents, how you're going to provide information available in accessible formats, how you're going to ensure that your website meets meet the international standards around accessibility, and how you're going to ensure that any meetings, conferences, and events that, that take place are going to be fully accessible. So there's a lot, there sounds like a lot to do there, but there's lots of templates and, and resources out there that can help you. And I'm happy to share them with anyone after as well today. But just think about it as a, as a saying, well, how are we going to change the mindset or the culture within the company that everything we produce or every piece of information that we give out can be, can be, can be made fully accessible or is already fully accessible to meet the needs of people with disabilities. Again, lots of resources and guidelines out there to help you to do that. But one of the key things about written information is make sure you create accessible documents uh, and make sure information is available in an alternative format. Digital information, as I mentioned, is everything from websites to videos to apps to podcasts. Um, and there are international standards around this. For example, the web content accessibility guidelines are, are the standards around uh, website accessibility. There's guidelines about how to make videos accessible. There's guidelines for apps. There's guidelines for podcasts. So you name it, there's got guidelines there. But just be, be aware that any piece of digital information that you provide, make sure it's accessible to meet the needs of people with, with disabilities and make sure that whoever's looking after the, the implementation of technology within your company is aware of national and international good practice. Um, so... The verbal information then is, I suppose, it's, as I said there, it's everything from the reception, the, the call centers, the seminars and events and things like that. And I suppose that's where your general disability awareness training comes in, is, 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 addressing, is addressing areas such as uh, the whole area of disability and etiquette. So just a few little tips there. Um, you know, if you're, if you're looking at the whole area of, of, of disability and communication, be positive in the language and terminology that you use. Always put the person before their disability. Um, and then involving people with disabilities as part of consultation i on the slide here i've just given you a few examples of words not to use and words that you that that should be used again it's all about being positive in the language and terminology to use uh, a key tip there would be if, if you are meeting your colleagues with disabilities and you think they need help just ask them ask them do you need any assistance if they say yes then then just so say how can i help because remember Two people with visual impairments may have different ways that they may need to be guided or, or assisted around the building and, and, and so on. So it's always really important that you ask them if the person says yes, how can you help? So don't assume uh, and, and so on. And again, if you're positive in the language and terminology that you use, 99 times out of 100, you're going to have no, um, never have any issues, I suppose, 
meeting and greeting, but assisting your, your colleagues with disabilities and your customers and so on. <clears throat> Again, sorry, I've come across some very good guidelines. This one I'd highly recommend, Disability Etiquette from the United Spinal Association. I'll send a link to that later on. It's a, it's a really good uh, document providing you with lots of simple and easy to use tips on uh, effective communication with customers with disabilities. And I've given you a table of contents of that there as well. I've also given us uh, two slides here on the 10 commandments of uh, effective communication with customers uh, are with people with disabilities that you can have a look at in your own time. Um, and then I've given a real two, two important slides here to have a look at 10 simple ways to make your written information more accessible for all. And the very first one, as I've already mentioned, is develop a policy. The second one is about creating style guides and I'll let you read through the other uh, areas in your own time as well. But some really simple things uh, in that. Also giving you some examples here of here's why you would use upper and lowercase lettering. And I'll just give people a, a minute to uh, 30 seconds to read through that one there. <clears throat> Sorry, so just really identifying for people with vision impairments and uh, people who are dyslexic, they read the shape of the word rather than what the, the block capital letters are doing. So the importance of using both upper and lowercase lettering, but also I suppose some tips here on the slides about like things like the, the type of fonts that you use, the size of your fonts, the spacing that you use, avoiding things like it uh, 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 italics and again, sans serif fonts are much easier to use and things like that. The importance of good visual contrast, for example, you can see the, the, the red, for, for example, avoid things like red and green, oranges and yellows and stuff like that. Having good visual contrast uh, when you create your documents, avoid things like watermarks and, and, and so on. And then you have various different types of documents like plain English, easy to read. Um, um, so there's various organizations like NALA who can, who can provide assistance on, on creating them. And then just some tips on about, I suppose, creating technology. A very good website linked there to the BBC who have some really good guidelines around uh, creating a, 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 not, not just inclusive workplaces, but also in, in, in inclusive uh, server provision and so on. What, second last area I'd like to cover is meeting seminars and events. The message I really want to give here is make sure when you're hosting meetings, seminars, conferences and events that you think about accessibility and you embed that as part of what you do. So how are you going to ensure that your event is fully accessible and inclusive for everyone? So a, a, a few kind of headline areas that you need to consider. You need to consider about the whole promotion, promotion and marketing of the event in advance. So if you're sending out advertising, are you consulting with local disability groups to get them involved in, in a, a, attend the event and things like that? Are you ensuring that the information you're sending out is, is accessible and uh, uh, to meet the needs of people with disabilities? On the day of the event, how are you ensuring that you know, identifiable staff are, are available, uh, that there's an access point of contact, that the people standing at the top of the room are delivering accessible presentations, uh, that the stage is accessible, that the breakout rooms are accessible, that there's hearing enhancement systems provided and things like that. Um, and what I would say to you after today is I'll send some really good events checklists that you can use. But the message I'm trying to give here is that one of the key areas that, you know, lots of companies will do is they'll have meetings, they'll have seminars, they'll have town halls, they'll have, you know, uh, various workshops and things like that. But make sure you plan for accessibility as part of the delivery of those uh, meetings, seminars and events, because that's that will allow you create a, an inclusive workplace. Last areas, but, but last but by no means least is the premises. So make sure your buildings and your workplaces are fully accessible and inclusive. And that's not just about the design. It's also about the operations of the, of the facility. It's also about the health and safety. Um, and it's also about when you're carrying out repairs and ret retrofits and so on. So here are just six simple tips about uh, the, op the, the operations of your, of your workplaces to maintain accessibility. So number one, carry out regular maintenance checks. Uh, to address accessibility, I will send you a checklist later on about that you can go around your building and you can check our uh, boxes being left in, in front of reception desks, ensuring boxes our bi bicycles aren't being locked on, on ramps, ensuring uh, floor finishes are well maintained, good lighting, good visual contrast and stuff like that. So I'll send on that. Uh, previous information I was on in relation to putting information up on, on your website, allow people to plan their journey in advance. Um, and then benchmark accessibility if you haven't carried out any access audits of your workplaces, make sure you do, uh, because the legislation and, the, and the, the good practice requirements are changing quite significantly. Things like dog spending areas, things like changing places, things like quiet rooms, 
uh, sensory rooms, lighting, con visual contrast, you name it. There's quite a quite a significant number of changes. Uh, disability proof all your health and safety uh, policies and procedures and ensure that your health and safety officer uh, is, is embedding accessibility in what they do. And then ensure accessibility is a criteria in, in the procurement process and consult with people with disabilities to identify what challenges they may have within your workplaces and so on. Um, so a few, there's a few more slides there on the on the built environment about access auditing, about creating inclusive premises and stuff like that. And then the, this slide here is just showing you all the key kind of areas that you would need to address to make your workplace accessible. But look, we, we, we can run a three day course on making buildings accessible to meet the needs of people with disabilities. There's quite a think about how people interact with your building, the journey that they go on, they approach your building, they arrive, they get in, they need to get around. And most importantly is what are the key facilities that you provide within your building and are they accessible? So think, maybe think about that. Um, so just to, just the last two slides, 12 recommendations on, on improving accessibility, uh, a point on responsibility uh, for, for accessibility within your organization and establish a, a working group or a steering group. That group needs to be representative of all the key departments, HR, corporate services, facilities management, procurement, uh, senior management, and so on, but also involving people with disabilities. Car benchmark accessibility, so carry out a high-level review of all the key areas within your organization and see how you're getting on in relation to improving accessibility. Develop a three-year uh, universal design policy and action plan covering all the areas, HR, training and awareness, uh, products and services, information provision, the built environment, seminars and events, and so on. Promote the good work that you're doing. So let people be aware of the good work that you are doing around accessibility. Promote the fact that you are an inclusive employer and get the message out there. Two reasons for that, it's, it's, it, it's, it's good for, for your company, but also it'll make, make sure you're accountable to, to people with disabilities because you're saying that you're, what, you, you, know, you have to practice what you preach and so on. It, identify what staff training needs are require, required and roll out training programs. Review accessibility of your website and, and provide a, a, a page on your website around accessibility. Um, uh, review the physical accessibility of your workplaces. If you are embarking on new projects, uh, make sure you have your own internal guidelines around universal design. So don't just go with minimum requirements set out in building regulations. So we've worked with a number of companies and developed their own in-house universal design guidelines to make the built environment more accessible. So just watch out for that. Don't just stick to minimum requirements and building regulations, strive, strive towards good practice. Ensure those with the responsibility for the day-to-day -day operations of your building manage accessibility. Ensure all written information that you provide is accessible and available in alternative formats. Make sure your forms, leaflets and, and guidelines are, are fully accessible and make sure that any seminars, conference and events that you run are, are organizing are fully accessible to meet the needs of people with disabilities. So look, I'm going to stop. I have ran a bit over there, so apologies. But um, I suppose the main aim of the session, as I said at the start, was to kind of give you, identify some of the barriers faced by people with disabilities within the workplace, but more importantly, to talk about the framework and strategy that you should be implementing within your organization to successfully embed uh, accessibility and universal design so that you can create those disability inclusive workplaces. So the importance of senior management commitment, the importance of stakeholder engagement and consulting with people with disabilities, having a framework in place like a policy or an action plan, uh, having the right people sitting around the table, consulting with people with disabilities on an ongoing basis and continuously improving what you do within your organization. That is the best way you're gonna change the culture within your company to, I suppose, to create that fully accessible and inclusive disability workplace. I hope you found that beneficial. Thanks for your time.